No, the funny thing is, before I met you, um, just looking at the literature available on, on um, in the way in which this city is managed, uh, I would have imagined that you would have been a proponent of quantitative easing, um, you know, that you, you would be the proponent of um, an expansionary sort of budget. Uh, when you look at what the U.S. had to do twice uh, in terms of uh, an expansionary budget, what were your thoughts at that point in time in terms of maybe what the good side of it was and what the bad side of it would, would have been? Well, a city's in a different position than a national government, so you're, you're not wrong in um, uh, your instinct about what I would have believed in. I'm an economist, actually, studied economics before I became a lawyer, um, and uh, I think Keynes got it right. You know, when there is a significant drop in the economy, it's the instinct of every resident and every business to spend less, to retrench, for obvious reasons. And the only way to replace that gap is through government action. But I think there is a problem. In a global economy, you know, if you uh, use uh, methods that might have worked 50 years ago to put money in the hands of consumers, uh, let's say in the United States, and they buy things, most of those goods are going to come from Asia which doesn't help the United States create work. And, and I, I, by the way, and our property prices went up as a result. So, yes. Yeah, so yeah. The, the impact was real. Right? Yeah, you, you have a, it's, and it's very traceable. Yes. So I think in, in the modern world, you have to be extremely sophisticated. The government has to act when there's a recession. There's no question about that econ uh, from an economics perspective, because when everybody else acts rationally, they're spending less. The only people who can step in are the government, but you have to be very thoughtful about how you do it. And as a mayor, um, my belief is what governments should have been doing is building public infrastructure that was needed, but we hadn't found the money to do. That was the moment to do it and to expedite those projects. So you really hired people on real things that would benefit us for a long time. That's the way, uh, I think, as opposed to um, you know, market manipulation, um, to, to both follow Keynes and produce a lasting in impact that works, works uh, from an economic perspective. Right, and given the fact that the U.S. did uh, pursue an exp expansionary budget for um, as, as many years as they did, um, did you feel some of that impact on this side of the border? Probably a little bit. Um, things might have gotten worse, but we're, we're pretty unique. You know, if you uh, look in the skyline of Toronto, we have about 100 cranes in the sky. And that's for certain economic factors and because of certain policies we pursued. Um, that's not true in any American city that I'm aware of. Uh, when the crash hit, um, the cranes stopped in the U.S. In fact, the only two projects that stopped in Toronto were both financed from the United States. All of the ones that were financed here continued. So we didn't really see, I don't believe, a huge benefit from what happened in the U.S. Uh, obviously some, otherwise the slowdown would have been greater. And I think the U.S. had a couple of problems. Uh, when I studied economics, uh, we were taught, and I'm sure it's right, I'm convinced of it from my time running Toronto, that if you raise interest rates, you put a break on the economy. But lowering interest rates doesn't necessarily do the opposite um, for some obvious reasons. Uh, you know, business borrowing costs go up, they lower investment, but just because borrowing costs go down, they're not going to restart investment unless they see a business case. That's correct. And they, the analogy I was taught was it's like pushing a string. It doesn't work. And that's what you see with quantitative easing. Right? It, it probably blunted the recession getting worse, but it's off that in and of itself isn't going to push business to invest. You need real opportunities for business, and part of that has to be people having jobs and money in their pocket. At the city level, um, a consumption tax, um, it's a very debatable proposition. And in fact, um, and there are many, some cities that uh, don't take that route, and there are those that take that route to keep their bu bu uh, budgets balanced. What is your sense in terms of, or what are some of the um, guiding principles in terms of the use of a consumption tax um, uh, for a city budget? So from my perspective, whether you're a city, um, a subnational government, in our case a province or a national government, um, whether you're dealing with an economy in good times or in bad times, but particularly in bad times, you have to think about jobs. You know, some of the countries right now that are running major deficits, it's because not enough people are working and paying tax. It's not because their public services are too great, it's because people aren't working. And y you have to have a strategy that puts people back to work or keeps people working. And that's what we try to do within our jurisdiction as a city. So how do you marry that with public finance? Well, I think um, provided you can ensure that jurisdictions aren't, uh, that are beside each other aren't competing with tax rates, I think a consumption tax 
um, or an income tax helps a city do that. Because what happens today, if we make an investment that helps the economy, we only get a very indirect payback if there's new buildings built. That's the only way a city in Canada gets new money if there's a new building. Um, that's it. So we make an investment that helps the economy. The money's gone, and there's no revenue stream to help us make the next investment. So you need a tax that grows with economic growth. What we proposed as cities across Canada was to get 1% of the consumption tax here, uh, which is called the GST, the Goods and Services Tax. So that when we made investments that helped the economy and kept people working, some of that came back to allow us to do more. And I think if it's set up like that, um, then it can be very useful. I think the problem in some places, particularly the U.S., is you have a city center with one consumption tax and then the suburbs cutting it and trying to lure businesses. That doesn't make any sense. It's a regional economy nowadays, and these ne things need to be thought of in that perspective. Final question, linkages with um, Asia and the global economy. Um, what is your take on what's going on in Europe at the moment, and what, do you, what are you concerned about uh, in terms of how it might affect Canada. And in fact, uh, there is this whole question of uh, how Greece and some of the European countries are dealing with their, um, their liabilities. Um, and then perhaps just a little bit more on, um, extended out to Asia and, and how the Asian economic miracle, as you would call it, uh, sort of impacts uh, Canada right now. Well, C Canada's a trading nation. You know, our banks here have operations, particularly in Latin America. Um, Scotiabank, for example, has a very deliberate business strategy in Latin America. Um, and Toronto is a world city. And when you walk around Toronto, as I'm sure you've seen, you see the face of the world. And our businesses are more and more, although they've got a ways to go, thinking of themselves as businesses doing business with the world. And there's some obvious places where, where we've got historic connections with Europe, uh, we've got growing connections with Asia, um, and we've got uh, connections with uh, Latin America. And that's where the future is for, for this city um, in you know, business areas we're strong in. Um, we should be trading, um, we will be with Asia, with Europe, with Latin America. And of course, the European situation worries everybody. My personal view of it is, uh, when you look at uh, countries that are struggling with their debt and their balance of payments, they're also the countries that have high unemployment rates. And the first move should be to make sure people are working. And they should be working, uh, if they can't find private sector work, then build the things that are needed in those countries, uh, just like the New Deal in uh, the 1930s. Build the things that are needed, and that will help the economy revive, and it will also help their struggles with the debt. I think that's absolutely the first thing. And the second thing, from my perspective, is you can't cut your way out of these kinds of economic situations because as governments make cuts, that has a negative impact on the economy. So you have to find a way for governments to be efficient, to meet their debts, to keep people working, and sometimes that involves tax revenue. And it's not very popular to say that, but sometimes, uh, and I, so I have some sympathy with President Obama who uh, calls for people who are doing well, millionaires, to pay a little bit more to help those who aren't. In fact, uh, in sentiments like that, it's, uh, that makes it very difficult to place you on the spectrum of, a, of an American type uh, left and right. Um, it's, uh, it's because I'm a mayor. You know, by the nature of your position, mayors are very practical. Um, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm a social democrat. That's, that's my nature. But in, particularly in Canada, um, and I think it's true in the U.S., mayors are practical. We want to make things happen. And how does your city succeed? You've got to have jobs. You have to have a strong private sector. But you also need public investment in the infrastructure that keeps the city successful. But, but and that's as, what we tried to do. But as mayor, you, you actually um, did not do the third term that you promised, to, that you promised yourself to do um, with a number of those pro infrastructure projects still hanging in the air. In fact, they were reversed after you left. Well, they're not, not quite, but um, I would say they're slowed down because they've been started. But uh, I had originally uh, intended to do three terms when they were three years. So I was prepared to serve nine. If I'd had to serve again, it would have been 11, and my children would have been in university, and I never would have been home two nights in a row in their entire life. So that's why I stepped back. Um, it is hard when you know what needs to be done. To see, uh, to see it be slowed down. Our transit plans, for example, uh, instead of building three lines, uh, the current administration is uh, burying one line and using all the money for that. 
in our context, that's not a very wise thing to do. It's not a good use of, of money uh, because you need a network. The successful uh, transit uh, cities all have a network. Um, but, you know, that's up to the people to say as well. It's not just my city. It's a city of nearly three million people. and. Um, we have a wonderful, thriving democracy, and I've got no doubt people are going to speak up. David Miller, thank you very much for giving us your insights on I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you.